and I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you this afternoon to talk about one of my favorite topics, the history of fake news and some tips for spotting it. Just by way of background, I'm, um, I'm a retired lawyer. I spent 35 years practicing law. And after that, I um, came up to Stanford where I'm a visiting scholar at the Stanford Center on Longevity. And the issue I'm looking at is how we met, might help older people, uh, people over 60, and I include myself in that. I'm about to have my 64th birthday. How we might help older people um, be good consumers of online information and separate uh, fact from fiction online. So uh, today I thought I would go through some of the history of fake news uh, and I would I'll give you a couple of definitions so we are all talking about the same thing. I'll talk a little bit about who falls for fake news and why, why we tend to sometimes believe what we see online even if we shouldn't. And then I'll end with a few tips for uh, how, you can, how you can evaluate information that you see on the internet. And uh, I'll leave plenty of time for questions. So that's, that's the plan. And um, let me just dive right in. Uh, the, the main thing about the history of fake news is that there, there is a history. It's nothing new. Uh, Mark Twain is famously quoted as saying that it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. And that sentiment, the idea that um, people put out things that, is not, that are not necessarily true, is not something born of the internet. Um, it's been around for a very long time. And uh, if you can see my slide here, this is a picture of a printing press from the 15th century. Some people would tell you that fake news really took off with Gutenberg's printing press. Once books and pamphlets could be distributed uh, around the world, uh, eventually, um, that, that, uh, that was the beginning of the fake news epidemic. Uh, so I'm sure that, I, I wish we were all in the same room because I would ask all of you to give me examples of fake news you'd seen in your lifetime, but because we can't do that, I thought I'd just give you some examples on the screen here. Uh, fake news came to America uh, just as the, with, with the uh, pilgrims. John Adams, our second president, is famous for saying that there's been more uh, error propagated by the press in the last 10 years than in 100 years before 1798. Uh, and I went back to look at some of the stories we saw in, in uh, press in the, in the newspaper um, before the internet. And I, I learned about the great moon hoax of 1835. This is a picture supposedly showing life on the moon as discovered by a very famous astronomer back in 1835. And the, the reason I'm bringing this up is it shows us that fake news sells. Uh, people get interested in stories that seem uh, almost too, too strange to be true. So for um, six weeks, the Sun newspaper in New York ran a series of life on the moon with all sorts of pictures and stories. And it took a while before they were able to unmask the person who posed as the astronomer and determine that all of this was completely made up. So if fake news has been around for such a long time, why am I talking about it? Why do you hear about it so much in the paper? Why is it a big deal? Why, why are the news channels talking about it? And the difference, of course, is the internet. Um, the, uh, the ability to spread news has multiplied beyond anything we could ever have imagined you know, 30 years ago. You can reach more people more quickly than any newspaper ever did. Uh, just by way of example, the New York Times delivery service on Sunday reaches a million people. Um, Facebook uh, reaches 2.5 four or five billion people a month. YouTube has two billion users a month. And the amount of content that is put online um, is just uh, monumental. So although we um, talking about a virus these days is not anything anyone wants to hear about again, fake news is really its own kind of pandemic. We have a, 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 an infodemic uh, as, as the World Health Organization has called it of online news that, um, that can't be believed and it spreads faster and more wi widely 
than news ever did, uh, than much faster than uh, Gutenberg could ever have dreamed when he invented his printing press. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about fake news. It's a term that gets thrown around quite a bit. And there's a few different kinds and many of them I know you're gonna be familiar with. Uh, I wish I could see you all again because I would ask how many people used to watch the Jon Stewart show. That was one of my favorites. Um, Jon Stewart would um, act as if he was delivering a news broadcast. He looks like he's delivering the news. Uh, he would say some things that were true, some that he exaggerated, and some that he completely made up. But the difference between this kind of news is it, it's parody and satire, and, and we, the audience, are in on the joke. We know when we're watching Jon Stewart, when we were watching Jon Stewart, uh, that, that he was joking around. And because we're in on the joke, it's not the kind of fake news I'm talking about today where we, where we have trouble understanding what we should believe and what we shouldn't. We, we knew we were just watching for entertainment value. Kind of similar to that, another kind of fake news that everybody is familiar with and yet is not really a big problem is propaganda or advertising. And I've actually found this, this slide in a research paper on online disinformation. Uh, the right-hand side of the hamburger is what McDonald's puts up when it wants, uh, as an advertisement, to persuade you to come order a quarter pounder. And the left-hand side is most likely what your quarter pounder is going to look like when you actually get it. And uh, although this is fake in a certain sense, again, we're in on the story. We know that advertising exaggerates and we're not necessarily misled by this. We, we know to expect that advertising is going to be a little bit over the top. That is very different from the kind of thing that we're seeing today. And I want to show you uh, an example of what's called deep fakes, where images are actually manipulated to change what you're seeing in a way that's not nearly as obvious as Jon Stewart or a McDonald's ad. This is a picture from a magazine cover. Um, you all will remember the, um, the school shootings that have occurred over recent years. And these are some survivors of a school shooting in Parkland, Florida. And they're posing for this magazine cover to make a statement um, about how serious that shooting was. And you'll see that this young woman is holding up a target practice sheet. That was to be, that was the cover of Teen Vogue that particular month. Um, but in some, uh, on some websites, this photograph, and I want you to look very closely at this, uh, this, uh, target practice sheet at the bottom as I go to the next slide, that was substituted out on some websites for a different document, which as you can see uh, reads, we the people, that those of course are the first three words of our constitution. So some websites manipulated this image to make it look as if these young women who were making a statement against school shootings we're tearing up the constitution, which uh, was not the case. So that's an example of a manipulated image that is very different uh, than the kind of fake news we're used to that's parody or satire or just advertising. And then another kind, of course, another kind of news that you may be familiar with is just articles that look like they might be real, but are um, intentionally and, and, and verifiably false. And a, a kind of classic example of um, fake news that you may remember from 2016, uh, which is when people really started talking about this issue, was uh, what looks like a news article on the internet uh, saying that Pope Francis had endorsed Donald Trump. And this turned out to be false. And I'm going to talk to you, come back to this in a little bit and talk about how we, how we figure that out. But I just wanted to give you a, an example of the different kinds of fake news and, and what, we, um, what we're really concerned about when we talk about uh, being better consumers of information online. 
Now this, uh, this slide uh, shows you um, a kind of fake news that is not political, but that especially these days um, might be even worse. Um, this is a, uh, a, a, a photograph of um, uh, some postings that appeared on Facebook as a supposed test to find out if you had COVID-19. And if you read this, it says that if you boil some orange peels with cayenne pepper and you breathe in the steam, that'll release the mucus from your, clear out your sinuses, and it will deliver an eviction notice to the virus. So this, of course, is not true. Um, and again, we'll see how we would look that up. But I wanted to just make the point that fake news can be about any topic, uh, and there's a, a, a massive amount of um, fake news about health. That was true before COVID-19. Uh, it is even more true uh, now uh, that we've been in a few months of this virus situation. So uh, I mentioned at the outset that I have been working on this at the Stanford Center on, Lo on Longevity. And you know, why, why is this an issue of particular interest to, to, to those of us of a certain age? And, and the answer is this, and, uh, this study uh, and a couple of others like it. Some researchers at Princeton University studied um, the, the last pres presidential election and looked at who, uh, who was most likely to visit fake news sites and pass that information along to forward a fake news story to their friends or family. And the study found that it was people over 65. Uh, and that this was a study that, uh, that didn't matter for, if it was true of Democrats, true of Republicans over 65. And, and the study found that in fact, older people were seven times more likely than younger people to, um, to forward fake news stories. So before we all feel too bad about ourselves, I wanna say that there's another study, a couple studies out of Stanford of middle school, high school and college students um, that found not related to the election, but found that younger people similarly had a lot of trouble um, figuring out what's true and what's not online. Uh, this description found, the studies found that students online reasoning abilities are bleak. So it really is a problem for all generations in, in part because it's so hard when you just look at a news story or an image to tell if it's real or not. And I don't think we need to feel bad about ourselves because, um, because uh, studies found that we forwarded fake news. But I will say that the difference, the difference is that um, because of studies like this Stanford one of students, uh, states have started to require uh, education on uh, inter uh, how to be a better internet uh, consumer. There's uh, a lot of training being given to teachers on how to teach students to be um, smarter online. Uh, there's a lot of curriculum being developed and there's a whole bunch of money um, being spent, rightly so, to educate uh, our, our younger people to be uh, good online consumers. The problem is that it does cross all generations and older people um, you know, have, uh, have not, uh, did not grow up with the internet and also need some education on it. Uh, it's hard for all of us to get together in a classroom and there's no curriculum requirement for us. And, and most importantly, we as a generation are the ones who consistently turn out to vote in the highest numbers. Um, we're really good voters. Uh, so it, it's, uh, I got really interested in this issue when I, when I saw the study about older people and I put that together with the fact that older people vote. And that's why it, it seems to me that it takes, that all of us should take a little time and figure out how to become a little better at figuring out what's true and what's not. Okay, so um, there, there are even more studies about why people fall for fake news. And I, the, the short answer is that we're still sort of trying to figure that out. But um, the psychologists would tell us that, um, that there's a few reasons why, why it's become such a problem. And one of those reasons is that um, you know, the internet, internet platforms um, have a business model 
the way they make their money is by having people stay online and look at advertisements. Um, and I wanted to say here uh, that none of this is meant to scare anybody into going online. I mean, our, our computers don't blow up if we see fake news. We're just trying to figure out what's going on just like we would as we were, um, you know, when we used to watch television, we could evaluate the news and that's all we're trying to do here. But it's, it's worth understanding that, um, that internet platforms make money the longer they keep you on a page. And so the, the systems are set up to send kind of intriguing shots of who lives on the moon, the equivalent of that. Uh, things that are gonna interest you and keep you online and keep you, get you clicking. And you just need to understand that you know, the, the make, things are not necessarily true. Sometimes they're just there because I might stay online longer and um, that's the model. So there's the platforms are designed there to target the, the reader and keep the reader engaged. A second, um, a second uh, reason that is, I think, particularly appropriate for older people to think about is that as we get older, we become pretty sure of what we know. Um, and we, we, um, we've been around for a long time and we, we have, everybody, everybody has what they call confirmation bias. But when we see things that we kind of agree with, we're less likely to question them because we, we, thought about that and we know what we think. And so if something kind of fits in the way we, with what we think, we're not going to um, be quite as skeptical as we might otherwise be. That's confirmation bias. A third problem, and I, I don't know, I don't have to tell anybody here that uh, we are just overwhelmed with information. You can go online and you can find out anything about anything. And sometimes it's just too much. Uh, and, um, that onslaught of information makes, uh, makes it harder to take the time to figure out if what you're seeing is true or not. Sometimes it's easier to just say, oh, look at that story about the Pope. I'm just gonna forward that to my friend, you know, without thinking about it too much. And, and then the, the, the final reason, and this one um, really makes sense to me, um, is that uh, we used to know what, what we could trust offline and what we couldn't. So you, um, if you were in the supermarket checkout line and you saw a National Enquirer and you picked it up to read it or one of those other magazines right by the checkout line, you, you knew that that was a sensationalist magazine. It might be fun to read about it. You might see some pictures and some news that looked kind of interesting, but you, you, you knew from the queue, you know, by the checkout line, National Enquirer, you knew that the stories in there should be taken with a grain of salt. When you see a story on Facebook or you do a Google search and find a website, it's not obvious like that. You're not, uh, you're not in a place where you can recognize the cues. And I think that's really something that makes a difference for, for those of us who did not grow up with the internet. We just need a new set of cues to help us figure out what's real and what's, what's true and what's not. So what can we do? I painted a bleak picture um, and, and, and now I need to provide some hope um, because there are a lot of things you can do. And one of them, I, I, frankly, I, I think I could stop here and just say, just be aware of what you're looking at. Take some time. Think about whether it makes sense to you. That's a big step. Um, but there are some, some techniques that uh, some of these researchers have come up with that are, that are kind of simple. Some are more complicated than others. But the, the gist of it is going to be, you know, check the facts. Um, so uh, the number one recommendation out of uh, the Stanford group that did the study of, of kids that I mentioned is uh, to think like a fact checker yourself. Uh, what do professional fact checkers do when they see a story? So I'm, I'm gonna give you an example of um, what uh, of, of how the how the Stanford group just tested students and professional fact checkers to see how they would evaluate a web an online site. In in the study, uh, both the students and the fact checkers were um, assigned to figure out whether to support a a bill raising minimum wage. 
and they were asked to look at this website uh, and evaluate whether it was reliable or not, whether this information should be considered in evaluating whether minimum wage should be raised or not. And you'll see here, this site kind of takes a position. It says, businesses are closing because of the fight for $15. See the real victims of higher minimum wage laws. So this site by the Employment Policies Institute is, is urging people to be against minimum wage. And the question is, you know, is this reliable information or not? Is it true that businesses are closing over this issue? Well, how would you figure that out? So what was interesting about the study is that most of the students went up, if you see right up here where it says about us, so that means here's the Employment Policies Institute, Here's a way you can find out about the Employment Policies Institute. Is that a good way to see if this is good information? Well, most of the students thought yes. And they went to the About Us site and they read, I won't go the whole, through the whole thing, but essentially it says this institute is a nonprofit research organization. And at the end, it says it sponsors research at major universities around the country. So that sounds pretty good. I mean, that sounds legitimate. But the problem with a, 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 a website that has set out to convey a point of view and, and uh, not give you the full story is that they, they built the About Us section too. They wrote that. So professional fact checkers, interestingly enough, did something else to find out if this site was reliable. They looked it up themselves. They went to Google and they looked up Employment Policies Institute. Remember that was the name of the group sponsoring that site. They did their own fact checking. And what will happen for those of you who use Google is you'll get a bunch of different results. You can scroll down and pick what you want to see if you can find more information. In this instance, there's a New York Times article about the Employment Policies Institute. And if you go to that article, you find out that this Employment Policies Institute is actually a PR firm that is uh, sponsored by the restaurant industry. And that it was put together as a way of defeating the minimum wage increase. So whatever you think about minimum wage, what, what this tells us is that there are other, you don't always believe the first thing you see when you go online. Sometimes you have to be your own fact checker. I'm gonna give you a few more examples because I know this is a, a lot to think about, but once you get the general idea, I think, I, think, uh, I think it could be helpful. So back to Donald Trump and the Pope. Did the Pope, did the Pope endorse Donald Trump? How would we find out if this news article, if we saw this in our Facebook feed or we saw it online, how would we figure out whether we could believe that? And just to keep things even, there was another news article that said that the Pope endorsed Hillary Clinton. So both of those things can't be true, right? We know that one or the other at least is false. So again, you can go to Google. You can ask Google to look this up for you. Did the Pope endorse Trump or Clinton? Again, you'll get a bunch of results. I'm not gonna read them all to you. I'm just gonna show you that you'd get a lot of results to choose from and you would pick one or two. Let's pick the top one. Did the poor Pope endorse Trump? And that leads us to something called factcheck.org. And if we go to factcheck.org, we find no, he has not endorsed him. I didn't put the whole site up here, but if you go if you were to read this, you would see where the false story originated and what the proof is that it's false. You could do the similar thing with the story about the Pope endorsing Hillary Clinton, go to the fact check and get, find out that the story has been rated false and read about why that is true. So I'm just going to pause for a moment and acknowledge that being your own fact checker sounds like it's a lot of work, but it is getting a lot easier and it's worth taking a little bit of time to figure out online uh, where to look for true information. And what I thought I'd just offer now, if people are interested, I have a list of 
reliable fact-checking sites. You don't have to take my word for it. These are um, sites that have been, well, we'll just go through and you, you can see if you're interested in getting a list. But for example, on health information, if you um, wanted to know about whether bre breathing in steam from water boiled with orange peels and cayenne pepper would, uh, would help you out with the coronavirus, you would go to a trusted fact-checking site. Another one of these is sponsored by the Pointer Institute. And it would find, and you would read that clearing out your sinuses will definitely not make you less likely to catch the virus or cure you if you're sick. So in times like this especially, I think it's good to have on hand a few places that you can go, even if you don't want to do an entire Google search, you can just go to a couple of these websites and look things up, especially if it's a story you hear a couple of times. There's a lot of cures out there supposedly for the virus. So for example, a trusted site, the World Health Organization, has started um, an entire page to, devoted to busting up the myths about the coronavirus. And I'll, um, I'll just read you this example right here on the right. Um, it says being able to hold your, well, let me step back. There was a, a story online uh, circulating pretty wildly that if you could hold your breath for 10 seconds or more, that meant you were free and clear and you didn't have to worry about having COVID-19. And the story got, was attributed to Stanford Medicine. It was very popular. It was so popular as a story that Stanford had to retract it and say, we never said that. But if you'd seen that story and you didn't know about the Stanford retraction, you could go to the World Health Organization site and uh, it would tell you um, that the best way to confirm if you have the virus producing COVID-19 is with a laboratory test. You can't confirm it with a breathing exercise and doing that can even be dangerous. So having a couple of these uh, organizations or sites listed by your computer or in, at least in your mind is a way for you to look up stuff that's circulating all over the internet and get, get the straight scoop so that you can evaluate the information. And I want to just make the point that the best of these fact-checking sites are, are nonpartisan. So here, um, here is another take on... Um, this is a, 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 a fake story that went around about President Trump that was false, uh, saying that he was going to profit off the virus by issuing commemorative coins. And if you go to factcheck.org, the site I referenced earlier, you find under debunking false stories, this is not true. Uh, so these these sites, um, the good ones, as I said, will, will give you the straight scoop most of the time uh, on either side of the political aisle. And it's one way, um, one tool you can use <clears throat> to be a good consumer of online information. So if you've had enough politics or health news uh, for now, and I know, <laughs> I know there's been a lot of that, um, there's a lot of junk out there, just really silly stuff. Um, so there, for a while, there was a, uh, a blog post that Nor Norway had legalized marriage between humans and an animals. Well, you can go to another fact-checking site called Snopes. You can get the story, see what it's rated, and get the explanation, sorry, I skipped too fast, for why it's false. And even if you have a question that uh, the fact-checkers haven't checked, you can even go to a site that is, um, that is, uh, uh, uses only uh, experts in the field and, and PhDs and people with um, a great deal of experience and ask them a question. So if you are wondering if gluten is unhealthy for everyone or just for the percent of the population with um, gluten intolerance, you can ask that question of this site and you will get the consensus response of scientific experts um, and that will help you determine what you should believe and what you shouldn't. And if all that is just too complicated, you can also look things up on Wikipedia, which is kind of a surprising recommendation coming from the Stanford group. But Wikipedia, uh, it's a free online encyclopedia that anyone can edit. And, and because they are subject to the scrutiny of the whole world, they often get it right. And it's, it's worth knowing that if you're just curious about some funny story you see, you can go to Wikipedia and look it up there. 
So, um, as I said, I'm happy to pass out some of these fact checking sites, but I thought I'd also just retreat for um, a minute to um, some common sense stuff. And uh, this is why I love talking to people who are my age, because uh, I feel like we got this far by having a fair amount of common sense. And um, if you take that online and, and just think for a minute about what you're seeing, if a website is trying to get you to click on the next thing, that's what we call clickbait. And that's probably to keep your attention on it and to show you more stories, mostly so you can be shown more ads. So when I say clickbait, I mean a story like this. A man tries to hug a wild lion, you won't believe what happens next. Well, the only way you're gonna find out what happened next is to click, right? And that's what, that's what the goal is here. Not because you're going to be, you know, not because of a fraud or a scam necessarily, but just to keep your eyeballs on the page and show you more ads. So clickbait is kind of a sign that you, maybe you want to um, skip that page. Here's another clickbait example. Can you solve this ancient riddle? 90% of the people give the wrong answer. So I love riddles. I would be inclined to click on this until I stopped and I thought they just want me to click. Just want me to click to keep, keep me on the page and show me more ads. So skip that stuff. It's just a common sense uh, technique. Here's another one. A lot of these kinds of sites will use celebrity images um, to try to keep you interested and engaged. So um, if for those of you who loved Princess Leia like I did, you know, I'd have to click on this to get more information. I'm just going to decide to skip it. So I think what it comes down to, and here's where I really want to hear from you guys, um, is uh, when you're looking at stuff online, you've got to think to yourself first, uh, who's behind the information? So you remember I showed you the Employment Policies Institute site, and then we found by doing our Google search that the people behind that information were a PR firm, was a PR firm working for the restaurant industry. The second thing you ask yourself if you see something online and you don't know if it's true or not is, what's the evidence? Now be your own investigator. And remember I showed you the Teen Vogue um, manipulated image. The only evidence, so to speak, of those young women ripping up the Constitution was the, the fake image itself. You would not find any other evidence or proof or witnesses or anything like that uh, that would support that image. And then the final thing, and this is really the most important, I think, is what do other sources say? I mean, you could bet that if Pope Francis was endorsing a candidate in the U.S. presidential race, that that would be, you would be hearing that, about that on every news station, and you would see that in every reputable newspaper. So if you're only seeing it in uh, funky internet sources or on your Facebook page, you can, you can say to yourself, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me that it's true. And uh, just to show, just to kind of show you that you can't believe everything you see, you remember I started with Mark Twain, who supposedly said it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. If I go to one of my favorite fact-checking sites, Snopes, it tells me that that's actually not proven. I went and looked up that quote before I used it, and when I found out it wasn't actually clear if he said it, I decided to keep it in the presentation to show that, you know, you just have to do your own homework um, and uh, be your own fact checker. So I'm happy to take questions um, and get your ideas. So there was a question in the chat, <clears throat> Susan, about um, if there was a weekly fake news discussion group at Stanford, uh, I know we don't do one at Sunnyvale Senior Center. <clears throat> uh, you know, there's not um, one of, but I will tell you that the issue is getting a lot more attention now. I've been working on this for about a year and a half and just this year, NPR did a story about it. Um, there's a group that uh, is called Senior Planet that's starting to um, get interested in it. So it's a great idea. I. I um, I know Senior Planner has had a discussion group, and maybe they will continue it. I think, I think the idea of having a place where you could go and just talk with people about what you'd seen would be a really useful way of um, helping people understand what they're seeing. Yeah, that was my question. Um, 
and uh, I was wondering, since we're looking for ideas for the Sunnyverse Senior Center, would that be a worthwhile activity pursuing, and and what would be some guidelines or some or or a format that you would suggest to do something like that? Yeah, you know, I'm open to that idea. I think we were uh, volunteers and people who kind of are willing to lead and facilitate that discussion. So if there were a few members of our community that wanted to a fake news group and called it a discussion and how do we fact check for just a weekly or bi-weekly topic, um, you can send me an email. Does anybody, um, does anybody have any stories, any things that they've seen um, that they uh, they want to share or any examples from pre-internet days of, of <coughs> they remember? 